the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Thank you so much. But the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. May the peace and blessings of God be upon the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of the messengers, and all of you. Salamu alaikum. Today we're going to talk about two points. One of them is how we can be like the incredible homegirls and the homeboys of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the second is what differentiated those incredible individuals with us today. What made them so powerful that they were able to transform from people who buried baby girls alive to those who would weep begging God for forgiveness at night? How were they able to be individuals who established justice in a place where there was almost no justice? And how can we be of those people who follow in their footsteps and help people see that with Islam, justice is at its core and powerful individuals who care about God and fulfilling the rights of people are throughout. So, what would you say today in your circles, when you go to the mosque, in your MSAs, just in your like social groups, what are kind of some of the social issues that you guys deal with? Ignorance, okay. What else? Drama, okay. Drama about what? And where are you? He spoke. Any kind of drama? Like watching dramas? Okay, like what happens between friends though? Like, okay, so they get mad at each other and stuff, but because of what? Okay, your drama is not like his drama, so give him a chance. Okay, so it's because people are ignorant, is that what you said? Okay, so they're ignorant, so like maybe they might say a racist comment, for example? Okay, that's exactly what I wanted you to say. Awesome, thank you. All right, so what else would you say? Marriage. So would you say like gender relations in general? Would you say that people in our age group, although you guys are like 10 years younger than me, had to deal with things like sometimes slip in in terms of like guy and girl issues and stuff like that? Yeah? Okay, what else? Communication? Okay, what else? What? Okay, scream it. No, no, brother scream it. Oh, age gap, right. So there's like a generation gap in terms of communication. Awesome. And there's a sister who was talking at the same time. Oh yeah, gossip, which goes with drama, right? So all of those things are issues that we deal with. I'm sure there are a million more we haven't touched on, but some of those kind of go into certain categories. So why don't we do ourselves a favor and see what the prophet, peace be upon him, did in dealing with these particular issues? Because the issues that we deal with are the same ones that the companions of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, dealt with. If they dealt with the same things, and yet they came out as individuals who changed the world, then what about us dealing with those same issues? How can we too change the world? Let's look at three particular examples. We're going to look in the category of being gender relations. Number two, racism. And number three, drinking. And the reason I want to focus on drinking too is because this is a reality in our community that many of us might have slipped into or known people who did. But how did the prophet, peace be upon him, train the people around him? Let's look at gender relations. All right. Everyone's favorite. Springtime comes, my husband and I keep getting MSA requests. Can you talk about gender relations or MSA? People are going wild. They're like talking to each other too much. All right, so now, let's see. How did the prophet peace kind of deal with this? In his masjid, there was a beautiful girl who would come to pray. So she was like basically a hottie. She would come in to pray. She would pray in the front lines of the women's section. And a bunch of the brothers thought she was pretty. So they would come into the masjid, pray in the very back. Oh no, it gets so much better. In Rukur, they would look at her. <laughs> SubhanAllah, those are the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But he realized that brothers got issues. And so how did he deal, I'm just kidding, Sister Anne brought this got issues, okay? How did he deal with this? How did the Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace, deal with this? For example, when his cousin, al Fadl, was sitting behind him and they were like, you know, there were cars, but they were like, on an animal, which was like a car then, you know? So he was sitting behind him, and a woman comes up to ask him a question. Now this woman is attractive, mashallah. 
So Alfonso, who's a young brother, he looks at her and he's like, mashallah. So he's like checking her out and she's looking at him and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is in between them, right? So how does the Prophet, peace be upon him, react? How would we react if like, like, you know, you're standing with one of your friends and then a really like cute guy comes up and then like you see that she keeps looking at him and he's looking at her and it's like, why aren't you looking at me? Why are you looking at her? No, no, I'm just kidding. That's not what you would do. What you would really do is, what's going on? Like, lower your gaze, bro. What did the Prophet them do? He just turned his face. So so, so softly. And we see that because of this softness, People could come to the Prophet, peace be upon him, with situations that they were dealing with. So for example, a man comes up to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he's like, a messenger of God, give me permission to commit adultery. And the people around him were like, what? What's wrong with you? Are you gonna ask the Prophet that? Would we ask our parents that? Nuh-uh. You're not gonna ask the Prophet, he's the messenger of God Almighty, peace be upon him. You know how he responded? He brought this man closer to him. And when he brought him closer to him, he started reasoning with him. Would you like that for your mom? Would you like that for your sister? Would you like that for your aunt, for your daughter? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, continued to reason with him. And every single time, the man was like, no, no, messenger of God, no. And then finally, this man is convinced. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, puts his hand on his head and touches him out of this act of love that he shows him. And he makes offer him, oh, Allah, forgive his sins. And he asks Allah to keep him chaste and pure. So, what do you think this person leaves that interaction with the Prophet with? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That instead of going so that he can like, uh, you know, handle his business, what he decides to do is please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the way the Prophet peace be upon him taught him. Another example is a man came to the Prophet and he said, Prophet Messenger of God, I kissed a girl. And it wasn't like Katy Perry, like he kissed a girl in that time, okay? So now, what happens? How does the Prophet, peace be upon him, respond? The Prophet doesn't respond in this situation. God Almighty responds to this situation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glory be to God, reveals a verse. He reveals a verse because of what this man's question is. And this man's questions answer, the answer to this man's question is an ayah which says, where is that ayah? What? Come on! Okay. Tukbiya! <laughs> we are conquering the world tonight. Okay. So now, this ayah is in the end of Surah Tuhud. What chapter is that in the Quran? No, it's not 12, but it's close. It's 11. It's towards the end of chapter 11, which is almost 12, so there's excellent math, mashallah. Okay, so let's work on reading the Quran a little more so we know, mashallah. So now, this verse is revealed, and the way that this man responds is like, is that just for me? Like, basically, if I just pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse that if you pray, he's talking about prayer, and he's saying that prayer um, to establish it, and then right after that, it's saying that the good deeds wipe out the bad deeds. So this man's like, whoa, like, if I just pray the war, like, my sins are going to be forgiven? Like, it's okay that I kiss that girl? It's not okay, but his sin would be forgiven for doing that. So now let's look at us. I'm not saying, like, hook up right after this session and then pray Maghrib and it's all good. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that many of us have slipped. Many of us have dealt with people we know who have gotten into inappropriate relationships. Why is our message to our brothers and sisters and to our own selves? Is that Allah loves you. Just pray to him. He already asked us to pray to him. And since he already asked us to pray to him, let's just do it. And then once we do it, our sins will be forgiven, God willing. That's usually not our message, unfortunately. Lord is usually not enough. Maghrib is usually not enough. But if we were consistent in those things, then Allah would protect us, God willing, God would protect us from getting involved in things that weren't appropriate. How can you get involved with something inappropriate when you have like an hour and a half between the and Maghrib? Excuse me, the Quran has our government prayers all along today. But the point is that you don't have a lot of time in between. So it's kind of hard to keep messing up because you have to keep going back to God. So look at the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us about the ways that we can deal with gender relations. In these few examples, just a few, there were people who were like you and me, who got involved with people, who messed up, who wanted to get involved, but were protected. In each of these situations, 
the prophet peace be upon him taught the people around him that it's human it is human to be overtaken by our desires but that the best children of adam are those who make toba or make repentance when we make mistakes and that's what they took to heart so one of the things that differentiated them and us is that they took their mistakes seriously and they tried to figure out how they could fix it so one action item think about how can we work to fix our mistakes? Let's look at racism. I asked this question before, and I was sh unfortunately shocked to see how many hands go up. So I'm going to ask again. How many of you have heard racist statements from other Muslims? No, man, it's not even funny. How many of you have heard those types of statements within an MSA before? How about in a mosque? Your mom, okay. May Allah bless your mom, bless all of our moms and dads, bless all of our family members, and protect us from racism. Did you know that racism existed in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Of course it did. These are individuals who, like you and me, were involved with life. A lot of them converted to Islam. Do we have any converts here? Raise your hands high. May Allah bless all of you. May God give you the highest of paradises and give you steadfastness. Dealing with conversion can be very difficult or can be very easy. But either way, all of you have so much that we need to be grateful for for entering into our community, and we ask God to bless all of you. At the same time, those of us who didn't convert, how many of us who didn't convert found Allah later in life? We maybe did a few things and then came back to Allah. May Allah Taala bless all of the individuals who had to do with that. How about, how many of you were just born awesome? Just kidding. <laughs> that was all of you. Everyone's born awesome. Okay. But the point is that each one of us, in our different life circumstances, we had some background. The companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, also brought that baggage into their relationship with Islam, just like we bring it into our relationship with Islam. So now, what happens with the Prophet's time period? There is a situation with Abu Dhar. He is a companion of the Prophet Muhammad. He sees Bilal. He gets into an argument with him. Now, Bilal is a black brother. And mashallah, he's somebody who the Prophet, peace be upon him, heard the footsteps of him uh, in paradise. And he told him of that in his lifetime. So now, Abu Dhar gets in a fight, and he's, he's upset, and he's like, oh, you son of a black woman. And he says it very disrespectfully. May Allah be pleased with them. They made mistakes like we make mistakes. Now, watch what he does, though. He didn't just say that and be like, oh, it's all good. Those people stuck for Allah. And it's not even funny because we hear people laugh about it. We've laughed about it too. I'm not going to ask how many of you have laughed at people making racist jokes or how many of you have made them. Unfortunately, it's a reality in our community, but we can be the ones who change it. Look what happens. Bilal, may God be pleased with him. He goes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he's upset. And he tells him what Abu Dhar did. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, turns to Abu Dhar and he's like, Did you slander his mom? And then he says, to, the, to Abu Dhar, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling him, you still have some ignorance in you. This crushed Abu Dhar. He went to Bilal. He first asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, to pray for his forgiveness. Then he went to Bilal, may God be pleased with him. He's crying profusely. He puts his head onto the floor, his cheek onto the floor, and he tells him, step on my face. I'm not going to remove my face until you step on my cheek because you are the noble one and I am the low one. How many of us have heard a racist statement before or made a racist statement before and reacted like that? There's a difference between us and them because of the way they took themselves seriously, because they realized that every action they did and the way that they interacted with other people is going to impact not only this life, not only the way that their situation is with the entire ummah, but also in the hereafter. When Bilal saw this, he started crying. He went, he picked up Abu Dhar, and he kissed that same cheek that he had put on the floor. And then they kissed and hugged profusely. Imagine if we as a community dealt with racism like that. We don't need to say, racism, extinguish now from our communities. What we need to do is work on our own selves so that we're not the ones making racist statements or allowing for them to happen in our social circles. Let's look at a third example, and that is the example of individuals drinking in the community. I am so excited to tell you this narration because I find the things so incredible. 
This is before alcohol was prohibited. Do we agree that alcohol is not okay to drink in Islam? Okay, do people drink it? But it's not okay, right? Okay, now, was it always prohibited? No. So now, Ali, radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's invited to one of his homeboys home for a party. He had cooked some food, they had alcohol, they're like having a great time, may Allah be pleased with all of them, this wasn't haram, so it's all good. And Ali reports, he is the one talking about this narration. He says that they needed to go pray and they put him in front to be the Imam. So now he's praying and he recites Surah Kafirun. Can you recite the Surah with me? You guys know it? How does it start? Okay. So, And this is what Ali says. So this, these verses are saying, oh you who disbelieve, we don't worship what you worship. Like it's back and forth, I don't worship what you worship, you don't worship what I worship. Ali says, and we worship what you worship, because he's drunk. So you know what happens? Allah, the Almighty, reveals a verse because of this. Who knows what it is? Come on. Yes. and say that you knew that about him. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. Everyone you love and everyone who's in this room with you, Ya Rabbi. Alright, so now, Allah SWT reveals a verse. Who knows where that verse is located? You can't answer. Yes! Allah Akbar! May Allah bless you and every single woman who's around you. Ameen. Sir, Nisa, that's why. Nisa means woman. Okay. Now, and men around you too, Ameen. Okay, so now, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, He didn't have to respond with a lesson from this. He could have said, God Almighty, who's listening to us now and watching this moment right now, we ask Allah to be pleased with us and protect us from a displeasure. He could have said, companions, okay, uh, if, hmm, okay. It didn't have to be a Quran, right? It could have happened that it was revealed. I just don't want to say something wrong. Like, for example, uh, Ali, why didn't you not drink before you knew you had to pray? Or like, why did you make this mistake? Why don't you have some adab with me? Why don't you have good character with God? You knew you had to pray, but you still got drunk. Uh, excuse me, I don't say he got drunk, but he drank enough where he wasn't aware of what he was saying. So, the point is that the way that God responded to his situation was with a lesson for us all and all the believers there, that we make mistakes, having that relationship with God when we're praying, that's a big deal to say something wrong like that. That's a, that's a really, that's kind of like goes against the whole message of his thought. But subhanAllah, look at the way God addressed him. He just addressed him with kindness and mercy and made it a lesson for us, for everyone, for the rest of humanity to learn from. Another time, the Prophet PC upon him had a companion who was an alcoholic. He would constantly drink. This is after alcohol was prohibited. So now alcohol is no longer allowed, and this companion is drinking a lot. So when he drinks in public, in a place where many people can see him, he has to deal with the consequences of that action. So he deals with the consequences of that action. Then he goes back to drinking. He deals with the consequences, as in he gets, he gets some sort of punishment. He drinks again, he gets some sort of punishment. This ha keeps happening, happening, happening. So the companions get frustrated. They're like, what's wrong with this guy, man? Like, dude, just stop. You keep getting punished for it. So they start saying inappropriate things to him, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, stops them. And he says, by God, I do not know anything other than love. The Prophet, peace be upon him, excuse me, said that this man had love for Allah and his messenger. That even though he kept messing up and he kept drinking, and drinking is a major sin, he keeps messing up like, he keeps messing up like this. Yet he had love for the Prophet Muhammad, and he had love for Allah, and because of his love for them, the Prophet Muhammad, even though he knew he made this mistake, he bore witness to what he was doing. He bore witness to that love. So now let's look in our own communities. We know people who drink. Maybe some of us have. What do we do about it? Look at the way the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him taught us. They taught us to have character with individuals who are struggling. 
that if we're struggling and we're struggling with this, with this issue or with any other issue, at the very least, we should have our connection with God be strong and the connection with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, be strong. That we read the Quran, that we read the Sirah or the, the biography of the Prophet, so that even when we're messing up, we're still connected in some way. So that hopefully through time, that connection will help us leave whatever wrong that we're doing. You guys still with me? The companions, the homeboys and the humbles of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were normal human beings like me and you. They dealt with things that you and I deal with, and the Prophet was there with them to help them through those situations. Today, we don't necessarily have the Muhammad, peace be upon him, right here with us. But we do have what? What? Yes, we have the Hadith, we have the Sunnah, we have his life. How many of us, though, take it upon ourselves to read a book about his life? Or to spend every night reading one hadith from Bukhari or Riyadh al Salihain, the gardens of the righteous. We can have that same experience that the companions had. When we have that connection with the Quran and we have that connection with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I want to tell you a story of something that happened recently. Because we can say, yeah, but like they lived with the Prophet. He was there in that time period. Like, of course they're going to fix whatever mistakes that they make. But look at now. Let's look at the example of one person who took one hadith seriously. This story was told to me by my teacher. The imam who I'm going to mention in the story is an imam that he knows. This is what happens. There's a guy, he is from Egypt. You guys ever been to Egypt, anyone? Okay, people who've been to Egypt before, do they play the adhan like all over the city in Cairo, for example? Okay, do you hear the yafama too? All right, do you see masjids on the streets? So this is a society where you're reminded of prayer like all the time. It's not like, like, oh man, I need to pray. Should I find like, like a dressing room? Like what do I do? The reality in Egypt is that you hear the adhan, you hear the yaqama, there's places to pray, not necessarily always women's sections. That's a huge issue, which we won't need to get into right now, but it's a problem. But the point is that generally, there are places that you can find to pray. So now look, this man in his adult life had made the decision that he wasn't going to pray ever. So as an adult, he chooses that he's not going to pray. How many of us know people like this? Yes, many of us know people who might have prayed when they were kids, but as they grow up, they completely lose that connection with God, and they start praying completely. So now this man, he decided not to pray. Many years go by. He goes to work. He goes to the hookah cafe after work, which Egyptians know. There are hookah cafes in Egypt, right? So then after that, he goes home and he hangs out with his family. One day, after many years of this, he suddenly has this idea, just like, has an idea. Why don't I just go to the masjid, just once? Let me just like check it out. I wonder what it's going to be like. And the day he decides to go to the masjid is Friday prayer. And he walks in late. Have any of you walked in late to a crowded masjid before? Yeah. Is it hard to kind of find a spot to sit in? So. That's what happens to him. He's walking in, he's like climbing over people, trying to find a place to sit. And as he's walking around, he hears the imam or the khatib who's saying the sermon, the person saying the sermon. He hears these words just randomly. He hears kalimatan, which means two words. Thaqilatan, which means heavy. Gilal Rahman, which means the most merciful. So he just hears these words, but he's like trying to find a place to sit. He's not completely paying attention. He sits down, and those words are just playing over and over in his mind. All he keeps thinking about are those three words that kept going on. Totally loses track of what the imam is saying. After the prayer, he goes up to this guy, and he's like, I need to ask you a question. And the guy's like, what? Just kidding, probably didn't have one like that. But he says, the words that you said today in the Friday prayer, are they true? And he's like, what are you specifically referring to? And he says something about two words, and they're heavy, and the most merciful. The man smiles, and he says, these were said by the truthful. Who is the truthful? Who? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he tells him the narration of the Prophet, which is kalimatan, two words. Khafifatan ala lisan, they're light on the tongue. Thaqilatan fil mizan, they're heavy on the scales. Habibatani ila rahman and they're beloved to the most merciful. What are those two words? Subhanallah wa bihamdi and Subhanallah la alim. This man hears this and he is transformed. He's like in such a daze. He walks out of the mosque, he goes home, he gathers his family, 
And he says, have you heard? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has told us, kalimatan, khafifatani ala lisan, thaqilatani fil mizan, habibatani ila rahman subhanallahi wa bihamdi, subhanallah al-azim. Two words, light on the tongue, heavy on the scale, beloved to the most merciful. Praise be to God, subhanallah wa bihamdi, wa subhanallah al-azim. And praise be to God in his like greatness. In this moment, he transforms. His life changes. He goes to work and he talks to his coworkers and he's like, have you heard? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said two words. They're light on the tongue. They're heavy on the scale. They're beloved to the most merciful. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Subhanallah al-azim. He walks through the streets, goes to the baqal or to the place where he can get his like groceries and stuff. And he's like, have you heard? He goes through his friends. Have you heard? Everywhere he goes, he's talking about this hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. After a few weeks, his friends from the cafe are like, what happened to this guy? So they go and they visit him, and they're like, bro, you haven't been in the cafe in a while. Like, where are you? And he's like, haven't you heard? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, kalimatan, khafifatani ala lisan, two words, light on the tongue, thaqilatani fil mizan, heavy on the scale, habibatani illa rahman, beloved to the most merciful, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah al -azim. So now his schedule is go to work, go to the masjid, hang out with his family. Go to work, go to the masjid, hang out with his family. A few months pass by and he gets really sick. He gets so sick and he's lying in bed and he tells his son, go to that mosque that I went to, go get that imam. I want to talk to him. The son sees that his father's pretty sick. So he runs out. The masjid's like right down the street. So he goes, he finds the imam and he's like, hey, Come, quick, my dad needs to talk to you when he's sick. So the imam's like rushing. This is the imam that my teacher knows, all right? He's rushing. He gets to the room where the father is, and the father's unconscious. He waits, and finally when he wakes up, this man looks at the imam, the first one who he had heard these words from, and he looks at him, he looks at him and he says, Have you heard? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has told us. Say it with me. Kalimatan, two words. خَفِيفَتَانِ عَلَى الْلِسَانِ They're light on the tongue. ثَقِيلَتَانِ فِي الْمِيزَانِ They're heavy on the scales. حَبِيبَتَانِ إِلَى الرَّحْمَانِ They're beloved to the most merciful. سُبَحَانُ اللَّهِ وَبِحَمْدِ Glory be to Allah and praise be to Him. وَسُبَحَانُ اللَّهِ الْعَظِيمِ Glory be to Allah and His greatness. And with that He passes away. This man, if he had lived in the way that he had lived up till the moment of his death, maybe we don't know what would have happened in the hereafter. We don't know. We don't know what anyone's going to ha happen in the hereafter. But he would have never experienced that bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he did in the last months of his life. This man took one hadith seriously. One hadith. And it transformed his entire being. Imagine if we were to take one hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, seriously. If we were to take our relationship with God seriously. If we were to take this responsibility of being Muslims and helping people see the justice of Islam seriously.